Our next speaker, Andy Yan, graduated from UC Berkeley with a degree in civil engineering in 2000. He is the CEO of Indiegogo, one of the first companies to offer, to offer digital crowdfunding. Indiegogo allows people to solicit funds for an idea, charity, or startup business. Now, please join me in welcoming Andy Yan and moderator Ivina, student senator at UC Berkeley. Thank you so much, Kira. And thank you so much, Andy, for being with us today. Thanks, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, so as a Berkeley student, I believe many of you are also really spectacular. I'm thrilled to see Andy coming back as an alumnus. So to learn more about Indiegogo, about crowdfunding, and more importantly about you as a person to share your perspective and experience. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. So before jumping into any details, can you start with any like brief introduction about like your background or personal story that leads you to the, the role of the CEO of Indiegogo today? Sure. Um, so Andy Yang uh, graduated a very long time ago in 2000 uh, from Cal. Um, started my career at Accenture doing IT consulting. Um, went, uh, took a six month secondment, which we talked about, uh, doing microfinance in Calcutta. Um, and then went back to grad school for my MBA at University of Chicago, so another UFC. Um, and then uh, graduated, thought I wanted to be an investment banker. Um, spent a summer at Goldman, uh, got my butt kicked, uh, kind of wanted to go to a smaller uh, bank, so I went to a boutique bank. And then the 2008 recession happened, and then I was laid off. Uh, and then after spending some time on unemployment um, and just thinking through like what did I want to do in my life, I worked for a nonprofit, I was a consultant, I was a banker. I've never actually worked for a real company before. Uh, so then I joined Netflix doing uh, financial planning analysis, so FP&A. Um, and then after that, I joined uh, another company called Chegg, which does online textbook rentals. Um, uh, kind of doing more uh, strategic planning. Um, and then my wife, who's in the audience, uh, got a job in Toronto of all places. Uh, and then we moved the entire family over to Toronto. Uh, and then I was a, a VC, uh, started my own accelerator, modeled after YC. And then uh, joined a company called Fiverr PX uh, as COO and then eventually CEO. <laughs> Sorry, long, long rambling story. Um, and then uh, we moved back uh, after we sold Fiverr PX uh, and I joined Reddit uh, running core product for them. And then uh, then landed at Indiegogo um, after the investors reached out. So a lot in there. So just the TLDR is I've done almost everything you wanted to do in technology. So if you have any questions of what not to do, just ask me. So. So one thing I believe um, many of the audience will be interested in today is what thing at Berkeley kind of lead you to like the career that you are at today? And then during like your experience in entrepreneurship and startup, like what do you think are like the top strengths or like weaknesses that you see among Berkeley founders? Yeah, I think um, as we were talking in, in, the, in the waiting room back, it's like Berkeley grads have a certain amount of grit uh, because as a public university, like nothing's handed to you. You have to like fight for everything. Classes are sometimes, you know, oversubscribed, um, and you know, you just you just develop that kind of fighting mentality. And having been uh, at the other UFC, University of Chicago, a private school, it's a lot easier. Like things are kind of like mapped out really well. There's abundant resources. Class sizes are a lot smaller. Um, so really, that fighting spirit at Berkeley is something I super respect. And then if you you know like following the industry and the trends, like grit is a huge thing. Um, there's a book written about it. Um, so that that sense of grit comes from like uh, when I see Berkeley founders, it's like that grit that really stands out. Thank you. And um, given that not all the um, audience today are really familiar with Indiegogo, so can you introduce a little bit more about Indiegogo and why that's is really a special platform for all the entrepreneurs? Yeah, like Indiegogo is, it was founded by three Cal grads, um, and you know the, the mission is. Uh, to unite the world and empower people to uh, unite around the ideas that matter to them. And so, uh, specifically, we help uh, entrepreneurs uh, around the world get their audience and, and get their products launched. Um, it's a crowdfunding platform, so you know, check it out if you're, if you're interested in launching any type of product, campaign, film, comic books, we do it all. And so if you're interested in getting an audience for your startup or your product, um, it's a great place to start. 
And jumping a little bit into the background that you have, you mentioned that you work at Reddit yeah. um, as the director for Pro product management, management, and also you work at 500px as the CEO. So, um, what kind of expectations that you have before going into Indiegogo as a CEO, and then what kind of become more rewarding and more challenging yeah. compared to your expectations? Yeah, I, I, like just to show uh, hands around the room, who's interested in product product management these days? Like just a handful ish okay um yeah like product so i read it i wasn't classically trained at product um so at fire and px i was uh, quote unquote a product focused ceo um so really about product is this uh, obsession of, of the customer and the obsession about building value and that's honestly what makes it great for a good you know ceo is just this laser focus on building value for your customers and your uh your constituents and so really if you have that mentality around like, well, how do you actually build value for your customers? It's a lot about listening. It's a lot about judgment. So uh, product managers send a lot of surveys out. Some of them are qualitative and quantitative. It's how to interpret both types of data and using your judgment as you own to build in the next feature or the next iteration of your product. And so essentially if you're like a CEO, you're building not just a product, primarily a product, but you're also building a company or a, a team. And you know, the old adage or the cliche is, you know, the, the team that you build is the company that you build. Mm -hmm. And so those skills that I've built uh, over you know, my ADHD career have taught me to learn how to listen to people, to um, you know, listen behind what they're saying to what they actually mean. And I think that's the real trick of like, if I had any advice for, for you is to get up the curve on judgment. Um, and because, you know, as you found startups that are doing uh, very innovative things, there's, there's no playbook that you can run. There's no case study that can teach you. It's all about how you interpret data and your judgment on that data. And one similarity I actually found between all the companies that you actually work for, for example, you stewarded um, community service at Reddit, and then 500px is really like a community platform that's serving all the photographers. And um, definitely Indiegogo is also for entrepreneurs and startups. So um, what would say is the relationship between like entrepreneurs and their like community, and how do you value that relationship? Yeah, if, if there is yeah, one common thread around my career, um, it's it's a, a passion for like online communities, which um, can be quite an interesting place. <laughs> I don't know how many of you are Redditors, but it, it could be you know, kind of spicy at times. Um, and it's really like what communities uh, really want is just this transparency. Um, they want kind of a, a, a fairness about it. And those two things in combination, like if people are like, telling you something, they just want to interpret like the rules of the community or, or the, the norms of the community. And so again, it's about the judgment of like how much, um, how much governance do you put in on specific communities and what are the rules of interaction between, um, if you're in a marketplace as well, between both sides of the marketplace. So again, it's, uh, it's a really complicated topic, but if you can interact with your communities in a fair and transparent way, that's essentially like what they're asking for. And we also see um, there are many like new features that on Indiegogo that we actually haven't met before on other like crowdfunding platform. For example, Indiemand is something that I personally really interested in. And what do you think um, are those like specific features for Indiegogo that are like set it up for entrepreneurs and why that's really important for supporting it? Sure, I, I think, um, what, it, what Indiegogo, and obviously there's a, a, a competitor of ours, Kickstarter, um, but it's really the focus of, and, you know, and what the brands are going for. So, you know, we've had a tremendous success in tech and innovation categories, uh, consumer electronics, and that's an interest we kind of have cultivated over the last year, two years. And so, if you even look at the two different sites or other crowdfunding platforms, um, you'll see kind of like what they're all about and what they want to highlight. Because any platform, and any e-commerce platform um, will show you kind of like what the brand represents. And so for us, it's, it's this heavy focus on like consumer electronics, tech and innovation. In terms of specific features, yeah, like, you know, if any of you have done crowdfunding before, it's, you know, you've had a great campaign or not, 
and then what happens after. And so what happens after is, you know, we create this uh, product or this feature called in demand where people after a post camp, like post, what we call post campaign, can then still continue to raise funds. Mm -hmm. Uh, because you know both both us and Kickstarter and basically every other platform kind of bound you at 60 days before we kind of uh, not kick you off the platform but uh, stop your campaign. So. Yeah. And we also saw Indiegogo's presence um, at the Consumer Electronic Show in June in Asia. And then Indiegogo is actually a really active platform across the borders, no matter it's like in Canada, in Europe, and we can actually fundraise through like different currencies on Indiegogo. So what advice do you have for any like international entrepreneurs present today, or like any entrepreneurs who want to develop their brand like overseas? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have uh, five people based in Shenzhen. Uh, China's, China and Asia Pacific have been a very important, very lucrative um, region for us, uh, despite you know, the, the trade war. I think my advice for international entrepreneurs is, you know, if, if you do need help or you know, some sort of help translating your brand or your affinity over to you know, North America and European markets, and then you know, definitely uh, seek help. There's agencies, we have an in-house agency that will do these added services for you. Uh, but if you do feel like you, you can go it alone, you know, that's, that's totally possible. Yes. What we've also seen is, specifically in China, with the demand drying up from you know, the, the trade wars, they're starting, especially the OEM the, uh, manufacturers, they're starting to think about creating their own brands. And so it behooves them to like pivot and you know, instead of being a supplier and a neutral, now they're all starting to think about creating their own brands. And that's inherently like makes logical sense because if their demand is drying up overseas, then can they get a strong, uh, strong domestic brand in China? So, yeah. With the time we have in the rest, we would like to open the conversation from the audience. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask Andy, and, and I believe Andy will be really happy to take those questions. Yeah, I love Q&A. Yes, we have a question over there. Thanks, Andy, for being here. I have a question for you um, in terms of like Indiegogo as a platform. Like, any tips that you can give that you know, like how to like three tips that you can give to basically to prevent failing. Sorry, what was the last part? Three tips you can give, like as you know, uh, student entrepreneurs to stop from failing. Like, what's the tips? Like, what things not to do? Yeah. Um, not to do. That's in the that's a really good question. Um, I would say don't, I mean, it's the inverse of, like, be prepared. Um, a lot of our, uh, a, a certain percentage of our campaigning owners, what we call campaign owners or entrepreneurs, um, they're not necessarily ready. Uh, you need a specific amount of, like, creatives, um, like, so, you know, video, uh, really well, uh, illustrations, photos, um, know your pitch down, um, and so like those would be like the top. Call, if you want to call that one, like just be generally be prepared. Number two is um, you know like it, it's it's embedded in that. It's like know your pitch, know your value proposition. There's more and more campaigns coming out, um, so you really have to differentiate. So um, understanding your value proposition, what you're selling, um, it, you, you just have to be on top of your game. And then the third would be um, kind of, yeah, have that grit. Your, your, your first campaign likely won't uh, be successful. Um, it's that what we've seen on Indiegogo is about 40% of our campaigners are repeat campaigners. And so people are coming back on crowdfunding platforms after the, you know, the initial wave. And so more and more people are becoming successful their second or third times around. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, talk about your career path in the like straight upward arrow. Uh, what are some failures that set up your later success? Uh, I can repeat the question. Um, I think you said my 
career path was like, seems straight up, my wife will, will laugh at you because she just <laughs> went through the uh, you know up, ups and downs. Um, yeah, like I would say notable failures um, at Accenture. I was passed up for promotion, um, and that really hit me hard. But it was a catalyst to then apply for business school and just be like, hey, you know, there's there's something more out there. Um, and then it also afforded me the secondment in Calcutta, which really opened my eyes. Um, which is funny because like I wrote all my business school essays on I totally want to do microfinance, I totally want to do an NGO, and then I did it, and I'm like, I do not want to do that. <laughs> and actually, I actually went the opposite way. I was like, well, if I'm going to work in finance, then I'm going to be an investment banker, and then like just totally flip the other way. Um, and then, uh, like, so I graduated in the two worst recessions, um, and probably before you guys were born. So I graduated in 2000, um, and that's the IT crash. And then I think, like, uh, I graduated in 2008, which was, you know, the Great Recession. So if I ever go back to grad school again, like, just watch out. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, I got laid off uh, in 08 with the rest of my associate class, uh, and then. It kicked off this period of introspection, like, yeah, like, what, what do I want to do with my life? I know, you know, a lot of the people, uh, a lot of students here are wondering, like, hey, like, what, what should I do? What do I want to do with my life? Um, and, like, in the interview I did on, on video, I'm like, okay, it's like, don't put so much pressure on things. Like, you know, just take it as it comes. Whatever position you're at, just work as hard as you can. And then have that Berkeley Cal spirit of just, you know, raising your hand and, and, and being the first person that volunteers for something. Okay, so um, when, when you're building a startup, it's like from the garage, right? You're creating a kind of culture, and, and that's the culture that actually brings the start, like, startup to be successful. How do you preserve that culture as you scale to like 10 employees to 100 to 1,000? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I think the, the couple times that I've seen it, um, you know, one of the first steps is like to codify the culture. And so just like literally just write it down. Like what are, you, what are the values that you want your team or your company to embody? Um, at, at Indiegogo we have four. Um, you know, it's, it's fearlessness, it's empowerment, accountability, um, uh, forgetting the R. But you know, um, it's like write them down and then make sure that you like, like codify them but then translate them into like a, a, like a, a mnemonic where people can remember and then like highlight values um, through you know public recognition and so if you have like specific kudos weekly or monthly where you give awards based on the values um, there's there's lots of different ways to reinforce like my wife's a, uh, a clinical psychologist so you want to reinforce the positively re reinforce those behaviors uh, in, in your team but a lot of it is first on you know like codifying them if you have co-founders, you should, before you kind of set those things in stone, you know, um, uh, talk about them and make sure you align. And then, as I've done a couple turnarounds and just kind of been a hired CEO, um, it's really talking to the people. So when I first got to Indiegogo, I talked to everybody. I had coffees with 70 people. What do you like about Indiegogo? What keeps you motivated? What's the mission? And what do you not like? And so there's kind of like the anti-values that, you know, if there's a certain sense of like entitlement creeping in. So again, just like codifying, it's not rocket science, but it's a lot of just people ex ex exercising good judgment on it. Question back there. Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I think the question was, Indiegogo has great consumer electronics hardware. Uh, for software or apps, do you recommend uh, Indiegogo or a crowdfunding platform? Um, yes and no, it depends on the, the product. Um, software's a little bit harder for us, um, and I think any platform, but what we've seen success are like games or you know, certain like kind of things along those veins. If it's a consumer facing app, which I hope it is, like it's a great way to get an audience and, and to get a built-in um, kind of pre-sales or you know lead gen for 
for your audience. Um, but I, would, I wouldn't be transparent if I was um, not saying it's like a little bit harder for software for mobile apps, for sure. Yes, we have a question over there. Yeah, so when I was your age, um, I gotta call it 20, 25 years ago, um, what would I tell myself were, um, yeah, it's kind of like the don't worry, um, try not to have all your steps planned. Um, when I was thinking about when I was a sophomore and junior, it was, uh, oh, I, I, I wanna be a VC, I, I forgot who we were talking to in the, in the waiting room, but like, it's like, I wanna be a VC for sure. Um, and then eventually I was a VC, and I'm like, oh, I kind of don't like this either. So it's like you have all these like grandiose plans in your life, but I would say like um, definitely have a plan for sure. But like don't have like minimize your anxiety of you know just take it one day at a time and and it, whatever position you're in, just work as hard as you can, enjoy the moment, and then everything will kind of take care of itself. So. Do we have a question in the back? Sure, what is um, Indiegogo's uh, kind of competitive advantage against uh, like Kickstarter or other uh, competitors? I would say, yeah, like it's, it's our uh, ability to, to hone in on a specific audience. Um, I think we have strong uh, built-in audiences for tech and innovation, consumer electronics. Um, we're actually really strong in comic books as well. Um, and so like, depending on the categories, like, um, you know, we're, we're, we're definitely very strong. I would say also if you want to talk to a real person, we have like an amazing sales, campaign strategy, marketing team. Um, so we're kind of more of a, a personal uh, platform. And so when you want to reach somebody at Indiegogo, like we're definitely more uh, in tune with uh, entrepreneurs. So I would say those would be the top two. There's a lot of other nuanced things like, uh, you know, we, Avina mentioned in demand. There's a lot of other features that are great about Indiegogo that are unique to us, so, yeah. Do we have any more questions? Yes. Uh, so would you rather uh, find a community or make um, a community yourself? And when creating a community, um, how would you go about finding the people to uh, be the, the first people in the group to uh, grow that community? Sure, uh, so the question is, would you rather make or find an existing community? And then the second follow-up question is, um, how do you find the people to kind of see that community? Um, that's a really interesting question. I, I feel like if forced to choose one, I think it's very you know subjective of what type of subject matter. Um, what I've seen at Reddit uh, is that there's like these pre, Plan communities, and when new communities are formed, it's kind of like this cobble of the existing or an old community forking off to form like another community. We we're actually spending a lot of time understanding like community formation. What are the key factors of like building a strong and healthy community? It's really hard. It's like it's almost kind of like uh, this special magic. Um, the the thing we found at Reddit was it was largely dependent on the moderators of the community. So call it the co-founders of community, how well they got along, uh, the experience. So if there's like a long experience mod group that, that stayed together, that, that's more successful for the community. But I think it's, it's largely based on timing, sometimes it's luck. You know, there's all these algorithms that are surfacing discoverability. Um, but what's really gonna push it is like that core group uh, to find that, it really just depends, like, are these people, this, this founding, this cobble group, really passionate, or genuinely passionate about the, about the category or, or the subject matter? Because uh, that, will, that will tell, you can tell. Uh, like, communities are very, again, transparent, so if the mods or the founders aren't into it, they're good, like, it's just gonna come out. Do we have any more questions? Okay, we have one. 
Um, I, as a highly ambitious and successful person, how do you deal with work-life balance? So how do you still strive towards your goals, but then still, I mean, stay sane and have balance? <laughs> Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, w I think the, the cliche now is like there's no work-life balance, it's like work-life integration, um, which is, you know, why my family is here. Um, you find, you know, just pieces where, you know, hey, we're, we're having a, a great weekend, like let's just check out Berkeley together and then, you know, tack on things. And so it's really trying to find this synthesis. It's really hard. Um, having family, to working parents, um, it's a lot of trade-offs, and it's the art of like just compromise. Um, I'm very blessed with an amazing wife and kids, so it's like they're very patient with me. <laughs> um, and so, like um, my maybe uh, to your earlier question, my 20-year-old self would be like. Uh, the key advice is to marry well or to partner well. Because um, <laughs> that, that person will absolutely shape you. Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, it, it's, it's, it is hard work for sure. One more question from over there. Um, thanks, Andy. So there are so many people, audience here, are in their early 20s growing their you know, career. If there's one piece of advice that you can give it to us and we can take home, and start practicing, basically start doing on a daily basis, what would that be? Um, I'm kind of old school in this, but I would say like, whatever it is, just like work super hard at it. Um, and just have this dogged determination and grit that is, I feel like very special at Berkeley. Um, because yeah, like it's, Berkeley's not easy. It's, it's, it's a hard school. Um, and I think we produce amazing students. Uh, obviously, I'm biased, but um, I think, yeah, like, if, if you've made it at Berkeley, there's something about you that shows the amount of grit. Um, you know it's not going to be easy, but you've signed up for it, and there's no apologies here, and uh, whatever you do, whatever position, like, every day, just approach it with that same level of grit. We have time for one last question. Do you have one from the audience? Yes. Right. So my question is, uh, what are some of the learnings of building and working in a platform business versus the traditional, let me build an IP, which is defensible? Yeah. Um, what's, uh, what's the difference between um, operating kind of a platform versus building like a defensible IP, uh, kind of like a software uh, or enterprise software company? Um, I would say the key difference for the platform is it's like, it's like there's a huge difference in terms of mentality and so operating a platform is really, really hard these days given, you know, there's government scrutiny, there's, you know, your users or uh, whatever you do as a platform, there's always going to be one constituent or multiple constituents that are saying that you're treating them unfairly or that the algorithm is not servicing them enough, or like it's just, and you have to have that, again, that transparency, that judgment um, as a trait uh, and, and deeply ingrained into your company, into your culture, um, because it's, you know, your soul is bared to the world as, as a company. And so it's a, it's a different mindset than, hey, we're gonna build the best widget and we're gonna differentiate on these features, and we're gonna, you know, like, we're just gonna build this IP moat. Um, and that's much more kind of, call it insular, and so you get to kind of hide, if you will, um, you know, for lack of a better word, but you, you get to build and focus on your product versus if you're a platform, you're always out there, you're like, and your users are seeing every little tweak, every little change, and, you know, everyone hates change on the internet. Um, and so it's, it's just more of like a public facing mentality. And so I think that's the key difference. If you're, if you're building like those specific uh, paradigms, one is just, you know, you have to be prepared to be more public about things and be fair and transparent versus, you know, like the other. And I believe that brings us to the end. First, um, time was ending. And please join me for a huge thank you to Andy. Thank you.